Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, fantastic stuff. Right, we're going to uh, bring, actually Matt, you're going to come back up if you don't mind and take the seat down the end and we'll bring up a panel now which we're going to open up to questions from uh, Slido uh, and also from the floor as well. I'll try and alternate them. And our panellists, we're very lucky we've got more international guests as well. I would like to invite CEO of the Green Building Council of Australia, uh, Romilly Madhu, if you could come up. Thank you very much. <laughs> Danusha Whippich from Z Energy. I hope I got the name right. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Rhys Jones, the, the Public Health uh, Medicine uh, Specialist and Senior Lecturer in Māori Health at the University of Auckland. And John Moreau, uh, Chief Sustainability Officer at Auckland Council. Welcome to you all. Right, if I could get things rolling. Um, John, the, we heard earlier on from Councillor Darby about some of the things Auckland was doing well. I wonder if we could, you could illuminate us perhaps with some of the areas where we've got real shortfalls, where, the, where those acute problems might be so that we can think about those. Thank you for that one. <laughs> Can you all hear me? Um, this one's for you, Penny Parrott, if you're still out there, because she's grading me. Um, look, I think um, Councillor Darby did a fantastic job saying what we're doing. And in fact, just three hours ago, for the first time ever in New Zealand, we launched um, our first issue for a green bond. And I think that's something that deserves another mention, because what we're trying to do is say, these are the outcomes we want, much like what we did with we want you to fund a targeted rate for the natural environment. We want you to fund a targeted rate uh, for, uh, you know, for basic, uh, the, f the fuel tax, for instance. So we want to connect outcomes to the funding source, and that's something we're doing. So not to dodge the question and talk about what we are doing, <laughs> um, but I'm warming up for what we're not doing well. I think the material impact on climate change and why I think a lot of us in this room are here and why, what gets out of, us out of bed this morning is what's at risk here? And where we put our communities, how we grow, how we get around, those things are material to Auckland and Aucklanders. So I would talk hopefully a bit tactfully about um, are we actually funding the right choices for transport? Um, as Councillor Darby said, we made a historic move recently to, to actually do that. Did we go far enough? Maybe we can debate that. Um, same thing with our spatial form. Uh, you know, a great city is a dense city with options and amenities for everybody. Are we there yet? Maybe not. We could perhaps debate that. Um, a zero carbon economy must be circular. Is that the case in New Zealand when we're freaked out when our recycling gets burned instead of gets uh, sent off to where it needs to go? Let's debate that. So we've got a little bit of room to grow. Very good. Danusha um, from Z Energy. Uh, I'm interested in uh, you being here from an energy company and, and the, what sort of momentum is there now coming from business on climate change? Is it real? Are we seeing a genuine change and, and urgency, if you like, from business? Yeah, so for us, this is a conversation we've been having, particularly with our business customers from our inception, you know, 2010, and we're out of conversation and into action, and so are big New Zealand businesses. So there are people who recognise that the carbon intensity of their supply chain, it's important. It's important to their customers. It's important to the international trade. So our activity around uh, the first commercial biofuels plant here in Auckland, that's a commitment to action, conversations that lead to action. Uh, looking at ride sharing, looking at our role in mobility rather than in, in energy and saying, supporting Mevo with their EV vehicles in Wellington City. These are the sorts of actions that evolve your business and create a business that's ready for climate change. Very good. Romilly, from Australian perspective, um, I heard you making some comments yesterday. I mean, I wonder, is actually Australia maybe a little bit ahead of the pack when it comes to, or a little bit ahead of New Zealand in terms of targets and getting your act together and some of this stuff? I know you could probably beat us on rugby and cricket and make numerous commentary about that. Uh, but I think when it comes to this, it, I took a number of things away yesterday from the New Zealand Green Building Council's housing summit. Um, our building code it has been in place for a really long time and it's incredibly strong. And 
we as the industry engage very effectively with the Australian Building Codes Board. So we've done, we raised $750,000 with six state governments and the industry to make sure the building code's upgraded next year and that there, a trajectory goes into place for every three years of an upgrade, aiming for net zero by 2030, and that we, um, you know, we're really driving change. At a leadership level, there's a lot, it seems to me there's a lot more collaboration in Australia. I think part of that is you have a national government and local government and you have a fragmented property industry. So I'm not, it's just an observation. In Australia, we have local, state and federal and a very tight property market. So you could get amazing impact from dealing with 15 CEOs. Eight of them sit on my board. So we're, our country has been able to achieve a lot, I think, because of some of the um, structural makeups. But I really can't stress enough, the word I used yesterday was collaboration between industry and government. And it has to be genuine collaboration. And it really has worked very effectively in Australia. And, thank you. and does that extend to uh, Dr Jones um, from, a, from a public health perspective, uh, from an inequalities perspective and the impact of climate change? Uh, we hear a lot about a just transition. Um, but it seems to me that uh, those in lower socioeconomic groups are going to potentially end up bearing a much bigger cost from that transition. Do you see it as being just? Oh, it, it all depends on how we do that transition. And so I, I think that you're absolutely right that um, not only will climate change impact you know, people like Māori communities, Pacific communities, uh, low-income neighbourhoods, hardest and first and worst, but also the actions that we might take to address climate change can also you know, disproportionately affect those communities and exacerbate inequities. Um, so what we need to do is plan our climate action so that we actually maximise the, the ability to pick up on the co-benefits, so that the huge win-wins that we can get from well-designed climate action that can improve our health, that can create a more equitable society and more fair, uh, fair societies, and mitigate or minimise those negative consequences that we can get from, from poorly planned climate action. Matt, what, what's your advice to the people on this panel, people out there, about how to get that collaboration that we're, we're hearing is needed from all these disparate groups so that we're all pointing in the same direction? Well, I mean, I hate to be trite, but trust is obviously the key place uh, often to start. Uh, and one of the reasons I, I, when I give talks like that, I try to end with uh, the hug as the secret to saving the world is because it's shown that oxytocin goes up when you have human contact and, and that what is what is fundamental to trust is is that connection so whether it's a handshake or a hug or a uh, hungy you know this is this is a piece of how we build trust and collaboration is only possible with some willingness as well as is some, some form of trust so uh, I think that's universal hopefully uh, in the world of, in some in the way to build trust but I think you've got to find where you do have to build that trust to find points of agreement, identify where you have uh, uh, disconnects or a, a gulf of, of disagreement, and find a, a, how you build on those areas where you agree. So I think that's true in any process. It's, it's certainly uh, my experience, and others are probably much more expert than, than I could ever be on, on that topic. But uh, so uh, on climate, uh, where, where, where do you, where do you, where can you say where we're doing well here in New Zealand? But then where do we, where do we go on, on this challenge? Okay, it's a hydroelectric dependent economy, and when drought comes, we have electricity crises here, just like we have, a, you know, our version of that in California. We have extreme weather and fires, and uh, that disrupts the electricity grid. Um, you need resiliency in the grid, you need some distributed energy, you need some battery storage or pumped hydro storage or whatever it is to be able to have that resilient grid to be able to work through an earthquake or extreme uh, situations when you do have a drought and electricity crisis so you don't have to always turn to coal and natural gas. How do you, if you're going to move to a carbon neutral economy, you, you have to tackle these. And so how do you get people to work together? Of course, and, and the built environment is often one of the biggest sources of greenhouse gas emissions besides transport. Uh, how do you really reduce the energy load through the housing mix and find those places to build towards and throw out some big, hairy, audacious goals and see how you can work there to get there sooner. And then, yeah, you're not going to necessarily get there right away. But I think if, if you're not bold at a time like this, then it's a challenge. Danusha, we know we've heard from Simon Bridges. He said that he wants to sign up to the Climate Commission. So we're looking at carbon budgets down the road at some point. Is that... Did you need that in business? Did you need that bipartisanship, or were you just going to get on and do it anyway? 
I think it helps a number of businesses. So for our business, we made the choice to determine our own future. Uh, but for wider business in New Zealand, that certainty that's provided in the structure and the government structure enables long-term decision-making. You've got to remember, a lot of New Zealand businesses are small businesses. Um, they're people who are making decisions for today and tomorrow. To make decisions and commitments that are 10 years in the future, they need to know that there's not going to be a flip-flop around them, that they can make commitments, make choices around um, how they're going to, you know, uh, de-intensify the carbon in their chain or invest in carbon circles with clarity and certainty. All right, I'm going to bring in some uh, Slido questions that are coming in there. Uh, John, the an interesting one here, in light, of the, in light of the issues around central government, but will Auckland Council propose a regional carbon budget, this is from Nick Bishop, by the way, versus sector budgets that cross regions for the zero carbon bill? So it's an interesting idea, isn't it? I mean, are you going to have your own carbon budget? Yeah, thanks, Nick, for the question, if you are here. Um, look, I, um, we are right smack dab in the middle of this thing, and that's what's really exciting. Um, just two weeks ago, as Councillor Darby said, we launched our engagement on our local climate action plan alongside central government's zero carbon bill. To me, that's pretty exciting because we're saying, just in the spirit of trust and collaboration, let's do this together. And it's great to hear also that you know the opposition, Simon Bridges, says, yep, we're, we're going to sign up for this. So it's pretty much all hands on deck, and we've agreed that. Now what? Um, in the Auckland context, we would be foolish not to align with an ambitious central government goal. That's been laid down quite clearly by the Prime Minister, by the Climate Minister, James Shaw. So we will undoubtedly want to align to that. They're also talking about sector targets. We would want to align with that. And in fact, um, when we talk about our material emissions in Auckland, it's transport, folks. It's how you got here today. It's the choices you have to get home. Um, it's how you keep you and your family safe where you go. It's about transport. So if we don't tackle the material impacts through carbon budgets, we won't really be cracking the problem. Dr. Jones, would you expect those carbon budgets to have some sort of subsidies for low-income New Zealanders? Um, ab absolutely. I, I think... Um you know, when we look at a lot of the actions that we need to take to address climate change, um, carbon budget and, and particularly, you know, putting a price on carbon is almost always regressive. It almost always impacts on low income communities, those who are already struggling, those who are going to be hit by climate change hardest um, the most. And so what we need to do is the when we're um, using the revenue from those sorts of uh, mechanisms is reinvest that in, in ensuring that we don't exacerbate those inequities. Um, and I would also pick up on, on John's earlier kind of questioning around are we going far enough and I think and thinking about the level of ambition that we have both you know within the, the zero carbon bill um, but also more locally within Auckland and, and I'd just put out the challenge there that I think our level of ambition is nowhere near where we need to be. Um, we should be aiming for zero carbon in the 2030s at the very latest. Um, and, and I think a lot of the targets we have and a lot of the sort of ways that we think about going about addressing those, those challenges are really not even in the ballpark of where we need to be. Romilly, in Australia, what, what, what sort of targets are you uh, 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 the most... Is that a target you'd be going for, 2030? Where, and where is your government's leadership in comparison to... to or, or let's put it down to city-level leadership as well. Can you give us some comparisons? Sure. So um, the federal government's quite interesting in that we have a conservative government, but we have, as the Green Building Council and along with Neighbours, have done two things which is interesting with our federal government, considering they're so conservative. One, we're becoming a pathway on the National Construction Zone and uh, Construction Code, and I've made it quite clear that there's a trajectory in place. The other is we are the deemed to satisfy on the um, National Carbon Offset Scheme. And so Neighbours and Green Star are um, partners in that. But at the same time, our federal government's probably not going hard enough. So if you look at the local and state governments, all of them have come out with incredibly um, you know, aud audacious and ambitious goals. Um, Adelaide's a great example. They came out and said, we are going to be the first city, and so I give this challenge to John. Adelaide has said, we're going to be the first carbon neutral city. And the mayor went, don't know how we're going to get there, but we're going to do it with you. And, they, and we are a partner to that. And they have basically made the bold statement made the target and then worked with the community and the state government because the state government had nowhere to go. 
once Adelaide had made that announcement, they were kind of like, they'd look silly if they didn't support it. Um, ACT government, which is seen as a quasi-local government, is basically going carbon neutral. It has got the most amazing, uh, that's Canberra, it has the most amazing um, wind farms and solar farms and has just gone incredibly boldly at what it's going to do. So it's ignored the federal government and just taken a really high leadership approach. And all our local governments are doing some fantastic and mandating um, neighbours in Greenstar and, and taking leadership seriously. But when it comes to net zero, it seems to be new builds by 2030 and existing buildings by 2050 and it's just and the industry's done the same like they've all just set it down and said that's what we're doing great look here's one that's coming from slido I'll just i might throw this at matt to see what he thinks because it's an interesting one um it says how do you include the disability sector in your plans when so many of the climate change initiatives are for able-bodied people is that a something that you've thought about in terms of your, your thinking matt and your experience well, the, the, what it makes me think about is, uh, you know, disadvantaged communities, uh, whatever, uh, or uh, whether they're able-bodied people or uh, who face challenges that we need to uh, anticipate. Um, uh, just to, to, I'll come back to that in a second, but I wanted to talk about uh, your earlier question around uh, our, our poorest, our lowest income families and communities. They are disproportionately burdened both with the impacts and the costs. And what we've done in California is with our cap and trade revenues, made sure 25% of those billions of dollars every year are invested in low-income disadvantaged communities and that we give them additional incentives based on income uh, levels to be able to buy, uh, you know, if we get people who buy a used pickup truck to have a gardening business, how do we get them the incentives to be able to afford a cleaner burning uh, vehicle or even an electric vehicle if possible, and so we're allowing sort of double counting of incentives to be able to make it easier for that. Um, back to that, the fundamental question, I think that uh, when we were working with Habitat for Humanity, a volunteer-based uh, home building organization that, that works with families, one of the things that we looked at was resource efficiency. And whether you're in a wheelchair or you're eventually going to become an elderly person, uh, where you're challenged, uh, we need to anticipate those needs regardless of who's going to live in that home from the beginning and be, a be able to have you know, a, a place to bolt in a, a bar in the bathroom so you can hold yourself up getting out of the bathroom and not have to rebuild the wall. Um, and simple things like that and having more uh, lower level uh, light switches. So it's, it's not really squared to the question, I don't think, but it is a different way of thinking and approaching the challenge. So we, we, we put resource efficiency in together with the realities that somebody may become disabled or uh, challenged in terms of their ability uh, as they get older to, to move about. So how do we put those things in from the beginning? Danusha, um, Z Energy, uh, you've been sort of in the climate space for a while now, which is often a bit kind of intuitive given you're an energy company, but tell us about the, the you have to make a profit, you know, I mean, you, the costs of doing the climate change side of things, do you see it as a cost or do you see it as an opportunity where, or is it something you see as part of your, your overall brand, so you write it off that way, how does it work? It's not a write off, it's an investment, so the, our business needs to evolve and climate change is a way to engage with volatility, it's a way to expand your conversations, your inclusive conversations with the concerns of others. The um, conversation I had earlier with someone is it's amazing what you can repurpose from our history. The things that we know how to do well, analysis, insight, forecasting, and repurpose them for what we're doing now around climate change. So our white papers on mobility, our discussion around how will people move, we're less concerned about what we do today and really concerned about being and really excited about being part of the solutions for tomorrow. So all the skill set that we have, all the things that we've learned how to do, we can use them to take on this challenge, to work with everyday people. We see everyday people 65 million times a year. They talk to us, they work with us, they visit our stores. We work with big New Zealand business. We have a massive opportunity. So for us, it's all about investment. John, there's a few questions that have come in for the council. That's why we're here. Uh, yep. um, <laughs> this, one says, uh, this one's from Kath Dewar, and it says, good stuff, but when will council waste work get to ditch the single-use plastics at venues, e.g. RTL centre, plastic cups at water coolers? Um, I, I raise this, I'll do this question because it is a sort of a, 
it's something quite tangible and yeah. quite uh, small, but people like, are, are getting pretty serious about with plastics. Mm -hmm. Com completely broadsided by this question. I had no idea it was going to come up. It's not topical at all. Um, so just before I get there, I just wanted to pick up on something Denusia said, and actually something that Oteni said in the opening. And I think it's back to, to knowledge, actually. There's something really strong there about knowing what we need to do and actually knowing what the impacts are going to be. I also wanted to take the opportunity to shout out my team, um, all of which have worked really hard on something that actually has us have a stronger command of that knowledge. So we just recently commissioned, along with our CCOs, along with almost all units in council that deal at all with climate change, um, NIWA, to forecast what the climate impacts look like for Auckland over the next 100 years. Um, various scenarios, things like soil moisture, things like temperature, things like sea level rise, rainfall. What does that look like for Auckland? That's the knowledge we actually need to make better decisions. Um, and I just wanted to pick up on that point from the opening and also from Dudusha. Um, on plastic bags, let's talk about taking the tangible that we touch every single day and using that as almost a commitment, a personal commitment to do a couple things. One is just do the right thing. You know, we, we actually do need to do that. So I'll take that on council. I've got feedback by email today about that exact thing from a council employee who was disturbed by the fact we're not doing it well internally. I just outed us, okay? If we can't do it, how can we expect the rest of Auckland to do it? So point taken. But I ask everybody to make the connection between that one individual act and actually the bigger picture. That plastic bag is part of an ecosystem of production, consumption, waste that we don't think about very often until we touch it. So every time you touch a plastic bag or a disposable cup, think about what goes into making that, the energy, the people, the smarts, and just command that we do that differently. Stand for the fact we need to do this differently. Maybe right now we don't have a good choice. We only have bad and less bad. But actually, let's commit ourselves to thinking about the bigger picture. That's an independent, almost a, um, it's a political act. You know, and it's, it's maybe a little bit, uh, uh, you know, symbolic at this point. But let's make that an act that connects us to the, biggest, the bigger picture. So can I just add in there, um, Woolworths in Australia, as of tomorrow, has banned plastic bags. So it's also on the retailers and you as consumers to use your voice. Uh, so and Woolworths, obviously, with Coles is our, our biggest retailer. And the consumers use their voice and so then others will follow. So it's also, if there's any retailers in the room, why don't you ban the plastic bags? So we actually just made that move ourselves in, and to sort of link the two points together. It's a really poignant consumer and customer experience. And the back-end logistics to make a simple idea happen, whether it's removing plastic bags or recycling or designing your rubbish bin, how you design your rubbish bin determines how much people will recycle. And it's that level of consciousness in your business, that willingness to engage with an issue really deeply, not just, oh, I should do some recycling. I should do some recycling design it to make it easy and attractive, you know, I should give a reason, you know, make, make it easy and enjoyable for people to do it. And then I need to talk to all my back-end suppliers because maybe they don't go to Timaru as much as they go to central Auckland. Maybe I'm going to need to work with them, how they build their business. So we've worked to build businesses to help us deliver these sustainable outcomes. I want to be a bit controversial, could I just say, if we focus just on plastic bags, I'm, I'm going to try to be a little different here and say that's actually, from a climate perspective, it's a huge global ocean health perspective and marine fishery perspective, huge important thing for a coastal country like New Zealand. But for climate, and, unless you take it to the bigger picture and the bigger system, it won't matter, really. All right, then, green roofs. Uh, this uh, person asks, can they deliver widespread benefits, uh, can deliver widespread benefits to climate change? Does Auckland Council have any initiatives to encourage developers and building owners to create green roofs? I'll open that up to, to the panel in general. Um, Ronald, Ronald, you might have a view on that. Do they work? Do they, are they a good thing? They are a fantastic thing. What so, are they for a start? Okay, well, I'll, I'll just, um, so green, it's not just green roofs, it can be green facades as well. So it can, either can be green roof on the, on the top of the roof, but um, with um, Fraser's in uh, Sydney at UTS, the whole building, uh, one Trent Central Park is like a garden, like the whole facade is a garden. The reason it's really important is we all know population's increasing and we, per population, are losing our green space. Open space is different to green space. And green space is really, really important around the air um, effectiveness in a city and the air purity and also around um, 
just, you know, livable, livability in the city and our kids need to have the green space. So what City of Sydney have done is they have put it into their plan for green roofs and they've helped by planning to ensure that, that basically Sydney should look like just one big forest. Our buildings shouldn't look like a building, they should just look like forests. So there's ways that council can do this. But they're really great for a building because it's like a double or triple facade on a building. It, it literally is like cooling the building down. It has such fantastic impact both on the building, the people in the building and the city. Three, three quick points. We've got three green roofs at council facilities, or sorry, five maybe. Not a huge number compared to the facilities we have, so hold us accountable there. They work. You gotta be smart and clever about it, but they work, so there's a huge opportunity there. And as part of something that will be rolled out relatively soon, our urban forest strategy as council considers in an urban environment that green roofs are part of the urban fabric, or of the green fabric, not just street trees, which are hugely important in parks, but also green roofs, huge opportunity. It's an interesting issue, so if we hit, to, hit towards a point where, uh, is it, Matt, is it at LA looking at compulsory solar panels for new builds? This is going to raise, an issue that cropped up yesterday, it's going to raise the cost of building, potentially, not, maybe it comes down over time, but Rhys um, Jones, for, again, for low-income New Zealanders, how, how can they sort of contemplate a solar power uh, situation when they're struggling to get a house? Well, absolutely. I mean, um, a, a lot of the things we're talking about, I think, uh, you know, very much potentially things that could increase inequities and, um, and for a lot of low-income families, you know, even the, the dream of home ownership is unrealistic and, and to think then of, you know, what about even more expensive um, housing, it, it's a huge issue. So I think, I mean, one thing I would say is that in any of the strategies that we're undertaking, um, if we're not involving Māori Pacific communities, other disadvantaged communities. Uh, you know, we, we had the question earlier about um, the disability community. Um, you, you know, I think the key there is to involve those communities in the solutions and not just in a token consultation way, but in a genuine partnership. And through doing that, we'll find solutions that can pick up on the win-wins. Well, let, let me throw that to yeah. Matt, and maybe you could shed some light on that in terms of engaging with lower income communities, with broad range of communities on, on some of those green builds and those sorts of things. How do you do that in a genuine way that isn't just tokenism? Yeah, so when I first started work, uh, I mentioned Habitat for Humanity was a volunteer and uh, starting in 1991 with them as an organization and we were trying to uh, create some greener, healthier homes because I, I, as I encountered green building, I thought to myself, well, shouldn't that be where we deploy it first? Uh, the families that have the most uh, problems with asthma, they live in the most polluted neighborhoods and their indoor air quality is often the worse than the outdoor air quality. The energy bills affect them more than anybody else proportionally. Healthcare costs affect them more proportionally, transportation costs. So why don't we reduce that burden? Uh, and you come across this argument, like if we spend one more penny on a window, that means a penny that's not going into additional unit of housing. Well. We're also burdening that family with higher energy bills, worse air quality, more health care costs, more time off from work, lost wages. It's a downward spiral. So we have to balance it and be able to approach that together. And that's where we focused our energy on incentives and really trying to work with the building industry and affordable housing to change that. So I think you've got to be able to approach it together because it's a longer term benefit um, and find ways to reduce those costs, but, but also put incentives in place. And, but one of the things to your question that we discovered when we start, started working with the Housing Authority, which is public government housing, is the residents said to us, oh, we love trees, but when they're in the center of the courtyard in our housing, that means a shooter could stand, hide in that tree and shoot down at us. But when you've got uh, lights, you need to make sure they're protected so nobody takes them out. So you do need to engage people and think about it. Now, that doesn't mean you get rid of trees, no, but you find the right coin, kind of foliage and trees that will people are more comfortable with and be able to, to work through it. Can I just pick up a point yeah. on um, disability? We created a, a voluntary standard a number of years ago called Livable Housing Australia and it's for the aged and the disabled. And so when people are building ho houses, they either have um, bronze, silver or gold uh, and it really has forced our industry when it comes to homes to really think about how they're designing and building those houses for the future so people can um, stay in their home if they're aged. And it's all those things that you need to think about because we do have a lot of people uh, in our society that are, you know, are either disabled or aged and 
the, the houses, and we need to think differently to how we're used to. And it's really because it was an industry and government um, collaboration, it has been really great for going forward. And then picking up the public housing. In Australia, when the government's put out that they want the industry to build new public social um, housing, it has got to be to a Green Star standard. So it's making sure that the energy and water bills are so significantly reduced because they're getting the same houses as other people are getting. So it's just making sure they're inclusive and there's equity in how we're building. Now we've got about 15 minutes left or so, so if there's any questions in the audience, we do have um, people with microphones at the back and we could maybe take a few, start taking a few from the audience. As people go up there, can I just add to something Romilly just said? Sure. Thinking about access and age communities, there's a couple key points that we need to really keep in mind as a city. One is that providing people the chance to age in place is critical. And it's actually something that is uh, mentioned quite explicitly in the Auckland plan that was just refreshed. Um, that's a great community where you can actually be in a place for your whole lifespan. And then beyond housing, beyond actually the house, thinking about equity in terms of public space and safety and transport choice is critical for a city that's going to be world class. All right, have we got a question at the back there? Yeah. Yes, I was wondering, um, is there a conversation going on about having individual carbon rations that one could then sell if you didn't drive a car? So that way, if you were poorer, you'd end up getting paid. And if you were richer, you would pay your way, but this ration would go down over time till the 2030s. Interesting idea. But it opens up to the panel. Well, I, you know, there's been talk of carbon budgets uh, individually, and the best you could ever find was an online calculator to tell you what your carbon intensity was or your carbon footprint. And uh, if you travel by air, your carbon footprint skyrockets. Uh, and that's a challenge. But to your point, I think one of the things that's interesting about technology is so people uh, about here, but I would guess it's been a topic of Bitcoin and s cryptocurrency. Well, the real un underlying uh, innovation there is blockchain technology. And we are seeing startup technologies and startups come to us saying, all right, we're using blockchain. So if you have solar panels on your house, you could actually sell that to someone else and th that chain of custody is there and real. And utilities are beginning to think about, all right, we don't need to put in a meter every time we put in an EV charger. We could give you a lower rate using blockchain technology because we know that you're using it tied to your charging your car. Or if you are a lower income individual in your carbon intensity and you could demonstrate that through blockchain technology, maybe you could actually do that where you have a verifiable or lower footprint that can be then create a credit bank that you could then sell to someone and get some income. It's a, it's a possibility. It's becoming more reality with, with the potential of blockchain. And I think that's a fascinating idea because I, I look at, you know, what are the sort of current challenges you face inside a business. So we know one of the simplest ways that we can reduce our day-to-day -day carbon impact is by having great telephone calls, great teleconferences, no need to travel, the quality is the same. And we ran a, we ran a scheme where you sort of, you know, um, self-nominated every time you didn't get on a plane. You said, I didn't do this meeting face-to-face. -face. I called the client. We agreed. We've gone from quarterly meetings to quarterly meetings, but only every other one is face-to-face. -face. Like, we, we had that conversation. What we never brought into it was this idea of making that value move in the company. Like, you know, giving people the opportunity to then invest that credit somewhere else with other people. So I think it's a really, it's a fascinating idea that could go beyond that concept and you, you could employ it to create conversation and behaviour change right now. All right, another question up the back here. Uh, hi, thanks uh, for, the, for the questions and answers so far. I was wondering, uh, would like to direct uh, uh, some attention and discussion regarding our food production systems within the Auckland area and how, uh, what council thinking is uh, regarding how we farm, how we produce food, how we get it to the city. Because uh, uh, as um, many people understand and uh, know and talk about, food and farming is one of our major problems and how we get it in a sustainable way. Anyone like to take that? I'll just do the quick little punt here because I think it's relevant to every city and, and perhaps every business. Um, Hugh, I'd say it's a problem, but um, boy, we do food pretty rampantly here in New Zealand, right? Um, it's pretty amazing the capacity we have to generate food. Now granted, we sell most of that overseas and make money off of it, but I think the architecture is there to actually do some remarkable things with food and food systems. We might not have it right. I think your point's a very, very good one. Your question's a good one. Um, you know, when we're uh, taking some of our best soils out of commission by um, maybe converting them to urban 
Um, that's a problem we can't kind of walk back from. Um, when we're thinking about um, how far something needs to travel between farm to plate, that's a problem. So I think y there are a lot of problems here, but we're in the position because we know food here in New Zealand to do it really, really well. If I can just, um, if I could just add to that, I, I think um, I, I talked earlier about win-wins that you can get from climate action for, for health and for equity and for a lot of other things. Um, certainly food is, is one of those areas where, you know, if we can reduce our reliance on meat-based products and, you know, think about the balance of our, our food production, um, we can reduce emissions but also really improve health outcomes by shifting to a more plant-based diet. Uh, and also moving to more locally based food production and, and I'm really interested in the, the idea of food sovereignty and, and the idea that we can, you know, uh, get, get more self-determination, we can, we can become healthier, we can reduce our emissions from food transport and things as, as well as, you know, um, economic benefits as well. California is uh, one of the largest producers of agricultural products uh, uh, and foodstuffs uh, anywhere in the United States. Uh, there has been a huge rush uh, to taking the Central Valley and planting almonds, and they're a huge consumer of water. And as California has is, is seen extreme drought the last several years, and Southern California is very vulnerable, and there's this argument of, you know, we're sending so much, using so much water for agriculture and sending so much water to, to Los Angeles. We're a completely water -depend, imported water-dependent city, but we're changing that. We're working on changing that. Um, it's all part of it, and that the electricity that is used to move that water both to the farms and to the cities is enormous. I will say, and it's something we've got to think about, uh, and, and the methane that's produced off of particularly any animal uh, protein-based uh, economy is enormous, and we need to think about that and how we address it uh, through consumer behavior as well as biodigestion and better ways to manage these places. Uh, the agriculture community in California, the Central Valley, has become one of the largest producers of solar PV electricity in our economy. They've had rapid growth. They see it as an opportunity to reduce their, their you know, hedge their future risk in terms of uh, electricity costs, as well as produce uh, revenue. So I'm going to do an Australian-New Zealand thing to an American. Um, some I don't know if the Americans have back, done Matt. this, <laughs> but the Canadians, um, both in Vancouver and Toronto, have urban farms. So they look at that space, and I'm sure it happens in the US, but I'm just being cheeky. Um, but uh, in Toronto, where I was two weeks ago, the, the space that's not being used, the uh, local government releases it out at a very small rate to the local community to farm. And so they have vegetable patches uh, to grow herbs and vegetables and so on and so forth. And in Vancouver, where you see the big ro roads and anywhere that there's land, uh, in Vancouver there's these fantastic urban farms. And in, um, in Australia, they're building herb patches in, when you've got a tree and they've put a, a you know, box around it and there's herb patches and it's an edible garden. So as you're walking down the street, you can grab you know, whatever you want to grab out of the edible garden. So I think there's some really funky and fun things you can do to bring urban gardens back into our cities. Can I build off Romilly's fun? I mean, the whole food thing does a couple of big things, which is back to what Matt started with in the beginning. Um, we like humanity, don't we? Or we love humanity. I mean, it's an opportunity for us to do something that's really essential, whether you're talking energy or transport or food or whatever. It's to decentralize and really localize that system because it feels good and it happens to be more climate resilient and more low carbon. So there's a whole suite of reasons we want to do that and it, it's partly related to fun as well. It's a question that's come in actually, is what, it was to Matt, but I can open it up to you all. Why is local government more engaged than central government on climate change challenges? And perhaps it is because you mentioned, but Matt, do you have any view, Romilly? Well, it's really true. I mean, if you hear my former boss and mayor of Los Angeles, Eric Garcetti, and a number of other mayors, uh, Cities are on the front lines of climate change. The impacts, whether it's sea level rise and your eastern seaboard, uh, the Gulf Coast, uh, and our lowest income neighborhoods are most vulnerable in, in these communities. Extreme heat, we have that's one of our climate crises in California. We have hotter summers and uh, longer fire seasons uh, that build on that extreme drought. All these implications of climate change. And cities are in the front lines as uh, these, you know, the fires and lead to flooding and mudslides in our cities and near cities. Um, so that's why, you know, cities feel it the most, our residents feel the most, and that's where also innovation's happening. And uh, we're looking at this zero emissions future for Los Angeles, and, you know, we've got vertical takeoff and lift landing coming, or 
In our case, what's been innovative is something that nobody saw, which are electric scooters. So we've been inundated with birds and limes, and I'm sure they're coming if they haven't come to Auckland yet. But they, people love them. They go up to 11 miles per hour. They have changed people's behavior. They are uh, uh, really uh, something that, pe but cities don't know what to do with them. And so now cities are catching up. And this kind of innovation, so we're all focused on autonomous future. Well, the game changer right now is these electric scooters that people are riding about. So people are doing without helmets and they're riding in the middle of the streets. So you've got safety, they're leaving them everywhere on the sidewalks. Yes, people love them, but they're also a challenge. So I think cities are where these innovations are happening, whether they're intentional or not. I'll just see if there's, sorry, I'll just see if there's any more questions, if you've got any more questions from the floor, but I'll take, sorry, carry on, Dimitri, what's I was just going to say, if you think about it, there's a disconnect between us as citizens with our federal politicians, like there really is, I mean, the chance of any of us walking into the door quickly with a federal politician is low, but there's a dis, we're so close <laughs> to our local government because our councillors, we've got access to them, and it really is about access, and I think which is why cities are leading all over the globe is because they're the ones that are being affected, that are communicating so closely with the um, individuals and the citizens. Whereas when you get up to state government for us and then federal government, yeah, there is a disconnect. I wonder whether we need different things from our local governments and our national governments in the same space. So a national issue is somebody's real challenge and real problem. Um, it's not a hypothetical discussion or something they need to do something about. It's something they live every day. So that engagement across our different sectors of government, moving in the same direction and looking at who can effectively make the changes that are needed. I, I, would, I was just going to add quickly that it's more of a call to action to those in this room. Right now, you can actually have your say on the zero carbon bill. You can go and say what you want for the government to do in terms of its, its ambition around zero carbon for the nation. Um, and at the same time, you can actually get involved with us as we develop our plan for what Auckland should look like. So it's really all hands on deck in this room. I'd like that commitment from almost everybody in the room to be able to do that with us. All right, great. We've got a question over here. Hello. Um, I've got family in Australia, and I find in the Gold Coast, they spend so much more time inside with air conditioning. Now, I love Auckland. And I think we're moving to the ideal climate. We're the real Goldilocks place. Not too hot and not too cold. And you can be outside in balmy weather all the way from late October, November, all the way through to May. So in fact, I'm probably using less electricity and things because I'm not having to use the heat to the same degree during winter. And because it's so beautiful during the summer, I'm not having to need the air conditioning. So it's not always the argument uh, if you look at the whole world, there is an issue. But in any particular place, there, in fact, may be benefits. And we've always got to be a bit careful with the message that it's all doom and gloom, because some areas are actually going to benefit from it, uh, even in regards to farming and things like that as well. I think it's a good point, but the, the uncertainty it throws up is a disbenefit. And so, you know, there are four specific storms that hit us this year, in the last six months, that we were pretty surprised about, you know, one in 100 year events. And so, yes, there are some great benefits of a climate that we all feel more comfortable in, but we can't predict this stuff very well anymore. And that's going to be a challenge to our businesses and our communities. I've got a question over here in the middle. Thanks very much for your great comments. I'm Lindsay Wood. I run a company called Resilience Limited. I'd like to pick up on John's comment. I'm, I'm sorry, um, Reese's comment about us not setting the bar high enough. And I think there are a lot of areas we can think outside the square where we, we, we're just too scared to tinker with our lifestyle. For example, I like the suggestion about the carbon credits before. I think we need to give more thought to that. But Vancouver, I understand, has encouraged, for example, businesses to move to a four-day week. Suddenly, you're only transporting 80% of the time, and then you're also um, freeing up the traffic on other days. When the school times are either holiday time or school hours shift a bit, we wind up with suddenly a great drop in transport congestion. I'd be really interested to know the comments of the panel on the, the potential of those and whether they're being explored or not. Thank you. Um, so I, I really like the idea of um, thinking outside the square, and I'm going to take this in a perhaps slightly different direction than you might have been expecting. But, um, I mean, I think one of the things that we are absolutely not doing enough of is 
um, valuing indigenous knowledges and ways of engaging with the environment in this space. Um, you know, I think of climate change as essentially the, the inevitable conclusion of a sort of Western-style civilization that's about exploiting the Earth's resources as a commodity and, and dumping the waste. Um, and, and so I think that, you know, we have Māori culture here, we have a, a culture that's uh, all about um, relationships with the natural environment, about a very different way of thinking in this space. Um, it, it does remind me of, I was in um, COP21 in Morocco a couple of years ago, and seeing the difference between what was happening in the formal negotiations versus what was happening in the Indigenous Peoples Forum. Um, if you could have switched those rooms, we'd probably solve the climate crisis uh, tomorrow. So uh, it's about like really uh, decolonizing. And I think, you know, if you're not a, an advocate for indigenous rights for decolonization, then you're not a climate advocate. Do you have reconciliation? <laughs> Do you have reconciliation action plans here? So we uh, work with Reconciliation Australia and we have to have a, we, well we don't have to, but it's voluntary, but we all have reconciliation action plans. So it's uh, indigenous supply chain, how we're going to employ indigenous, um, how we're going to, for us as the Green Building Council, we have to talk about it in our sector. So what are we going to use to, to think about indigenous thinking into the design and construction of our buildings and cities? And in Australia, it's really, really big. If you don't have a reconciliation action plan, it's called a wrap. It's like, <laughs> Well, where are you going and what are you doing? Yeah, so I think if I, you know, I take that comment and bring it into the business world. Uh, diversity and, and inclusion, you know, there's no point having five people around the table discussing something who actually all have the same perspective. That's not a discussion, it's a reiteration of the ideas around the table. So having a focus and a clear plan on how you're going to bring different perspectives into the room, and that's something that we have been focusing on for the last year. And it's, it's a challenge because it's really easy to, to bring people into your community that have similar ideas to you. So uh, how do you critically challenge yourself? How do you hear new ideas? Every business can apply that thinking now. There's no, there's nothing else that needs to be done. And your conversation around Vancouver, um, my experience often is if you stand back, instead of trying to solve the problem, the problem is traffic, um, think about what really matters here. Like why am I even having a conversation about this? Why does it matter that we're all going in to work at the same time and causing these traffic jams. And then the conversation shifts. It also becomes a really accessible conversation and human conversation. Because you don't have to be an expert in traffic flows and timing of light signals to work out what matters. You need to be a human who wants to be with other humans doing some things and also likes to live a particular way. So that for me, when we think about what we can do as, as private citizens and in, in, in organisations, when we go to work and challenge each other about what is what we could do better, uh, come at it from what really matters here, why am I engaged in this, and go and find opinions that, you know, ruffle your feathers or make you think differently, give you pause for thought. That's a lovely way to finish it. Thank you very much to the panel. We've just sneaked over our time uh, limit, but thank you very much to uh, Romilly Medju, uh, Danish, uh, Danusa, sorry, Whippich. Got that right, hopefully. Uh, Dr. Rhys Jones and uh, John Moreau, and of course Matt Peterson. But I'd like to ask um, Andrew Eagles, CEO of the New Zealand Green Building Council, to come up for a vote of thanks. Yes. I haven't seen it arrive. Baby girl. Oh. I was too busy, didn't check my phone. A baby girl, there you go. Well, nobody stole my thunder there. <laughs> Thank you. There he was sitting in his chair thinking, I might get to say it. I might get to say it. <laughs> hey, um, no, no, that's fine. Um, isn't, it, isn't it wonderful? And, you know, reflecting just on that, let's see if he can segue into this. Um, don't we want a better society for our children and our grandchildren? And one of the reflections I've got from this really brilliant panel and brilliant Councillor Darby and also great management by Corin Dan, I thought this evening, was um, it's simple to say, oh, it's climate and that's a challenge for us, right? And there's costs. So we go, costs, costs, that feels really bad. When I listen to these people, what I hear is, hey, active transport. I hear healthier homes. I hear more connectivity with people. I hear dealing with inequality. And I think that if we can keep up with that, we can do things um, that are really, really impossible. 
So um, I wanted to say thank you to the panel. I've been asked to just reflect a little bit. Um, Councillor Darby, huge respect for all of your work. Let's be bold. I loved it. And um, great work, I think. we need. It's a funny thing, isn't it? Because we're asked to comment, and I get asked to comment on how we're doing. We want to say, you know, it's good. The green bond is good. Sky, um, the sky pathway is great, and the work on transport is good. It is good. Maybe it's 5 or 10% of what we need to do, but we need to, st to still celebrate that. Matt, trust, audacious goals. And also, you know, what did we have? 20 mayors, and then someone came along and was a bit hopeless. What happened? 460 mayors, come on! You know, let's keep pushing. Reese, we need to think about inequality. You know, and I, I think this is so valid. The Productivity Commission has said that to get to where we need to, carbon price uh, per tonne of carbon needs to go to $250 per tonne. So that's going to hit energy, that's going to hit food prices, that's going to hit our, our bills. So we really do need to think. And I love Matt's, we've got this brilliant thing where Reese raises an issue. 20 minutes later, we get from Matt, oh, by the way, 25% of our carbon tariffs went to help those in lower socioeconomic groups. So there's a potential in all of this. And then an audience member, how about carbon, um, carbon rationing? Wow, look at that. Because then, actually, the carbon that someone in a lower socioeconomic group doesn't spend has a value. The thing I get excited by is actually there's a potential to build a far better Aotearoa through this challenge. And, and I think that's interesting. Danusha, I love using our, our skill set to adapt to the changing climate. And um, this isn't a spend, it's an investment where you make this challenge, the, these changes. And John Murray, huge hat off to your team for the um, analysis 100 years ahead. I mean, what, what foresight? We need that for um, the Prime Minister's grandchildren. <laughs> uh, Romilly, you know, the Australians, they come over here. She said, let's use our voice to drive change. And I think that's a challenge for all of us for actions with supermarkets, you know, and it's true, my dad, um, he's a raving right winger. And he said, he, I'm not so sure about this climate change thing, Andrew. I said, thanks, Dad, that's really good. <laughs> you, you know, dad, you know that's what I do. <laughs> um, and he, and, but, but you've got to listen. So we're sitting down watching TV. People said, ban plastic bags. And he said, yep, that's kind of good, but why don't people call on supermarkets to stop using them? Well, there's a truth there, isn't there? We need to say to our supermarkets as well. We need to drive everything. Um, and I really liked um, Matt talking about you know, better, better homes and buildings and that type of thing. So look, I just want to thank everyone involved. Then I've got an exercise for you. You've got some key, you've got homework, so you're not getting away. So first of all, um, uh, kia ora, Corin Dan. Um, you know, I just, we had a conference yesterday and it was huge and Joe Duggan just rocked it. But not everything goes really smoothly, and Corin was just so smooth through all of that, so we really appreciate your stewardship tonight. Thank you to Matt Peterson for his um, keynote, and also for your son coming with you. We really appreciate the support there. Um, what a brilliant panel. I, I think I'm just really honoured to be on the stage with all of you. Thank you to Councillor Darby. Continue your good fight. Thank you to all of you and those who are online uh, watching. I hope that's been of use. Um, and you're now still watching us despite seeing pictures of the Prime Minister's baby. Thank you to Auckland Conversations. We've got a long way to go, but you know, our, our council is starting this conversation and that's really there's something to be said for that. Um, the next Auckland Conversations event will take place on the 2nd of August. This event will be in partnership with Auckland Transport where we discuss healthy streets for Auckland. Now, your challenge um, I would ask you to stand up. <coughs> We're doing a double act, uh, Matt. Okay, so there's action we can take. We, we heard about it. We can lobby. We can call the zero carbon, you know, we can push for the zero carbon act. We can support active transport. We can, um, if you work in a building, you can ask about neighbours or Green Star. But here's something you can do to connect a little bit as well. I fundamentally believe that this is a huge challenge, but aren't we lucky, aren't we bloody lucky to have a challenge that's worth it? To, to work towards this for a better society for all of our people and children. So, I'd ask you to raise your right hand. First of all, 
Yell yes if you were inspired tonight. Yes. Yell it louder. Yes. Okay. Now I want you to turn to the person next to you. Okay. I want you to say, you too? You got someone to high five? Okay. Has everybody got somebody? I want you to high five and say, now let's get this done. Kia ora. Thanks so much. Safe travels. Have a good evening.